Got a question for you. Got a question for you. Where is it? Where is it? Anybody know what an Aiden is? That's the poet's way of saying Eden. Garden of Eden. <clears throat> I remember as a child, <clears throat> and I would see these maps. I don't know if they were in history books or what they were in, but I can remember as a child that I would see these maps, and on the map would be an X. Did you ever see one of those? That's where the treasure was hit. And I can remember thinking, man, how great that would be to be able to go out there with a shovel and dig that treasure up and open it up and here'd be all this gold and silver and jewels and wonderful things that a person could see. And of course, you know where it all came from? Supposedly, that's where the pirates buried their loot. In reality, however, most of the loots that pirates got was not buried. It was squandered or drank. Uh, normally, whenever pirate bounty or loot is found, it is found in the wreckage of the ships that they had that were either destroyed by storms or in battles with U.S. Coast Guard cutters of long Ago. I was reading an article that was a fellow by the name of Forrest Finn who around the year 2000 buried a cache of gold and silver and jewels worth two million dollars somewhere in the Rocky Mountains out west. And then he would write these clues as to how you could find the treasure that he had buried took 20 years. It wasn't until the year 2020 that a doctor, uh, a medical student from the East, finally discovered that loot. But you know, supposedly treasures are hidden in many places in America and the world. Supposedly, Jesse James has buried treasure out west somewhere. Clyde Burrow of Bonnie and Clyde fame supposedly buried money that's never been found, Dutch Schultz of the Mafia, and somewhere in the woods near Fairfax, Virginia, there is supposed to be a burlap sack filled with gold, silver, and jewels that were looted from the north during the Civil War. Who's ready to go to treasure now? In reality, we're going to go treasure hunting, and we can do it this morning, and we can do it from right here. We don't have to go anywhere. Man, who wouldn't want to be rich? Rich people. Donald Trump, he's worth $2.356 billion. But you know what? His money looks like a pittance compared to the money that some people have. Warren Buffett, $96 billion. Bill Gates, $124 billion. The wealthiest man in America, who is he? Jeff Bezos, the guy that started Amazon. He's worth $177 billion. But it's been estimated that the wealthiest man who ever lived was a king by the name of Solomon. Heard of him? Of the Old Testament? In today's money, it's been estimated that he would have been worth $2.1 trillion. But do you realize that we today have the ability to have treasure that makes theirs look like empty piggy banks? Jesus talked about true treasure. You know, Jesus Himself was not rich. Financially speaking, our Lord was a poor man. In fact, He was in the city or in the village of Capernaum and the tax collectors came. And they asked Peter, they said, does not your master pay his tribute? Doesn't he pay taxes? And Peter said, yes. 
And Jesus decided he better pay his taxes in order to keep in standing with all the other people who were there. I mean, if you don't pay your taxes, what type of character are you? So Jesus wanted to be sure that he paid his taxes that the government said that he needed to pay. You remember how he was able to pay his taxes? He told Peter, go to the sea, the sea of Galilee. You cast out a hook, and the first fish that you catch, you open that fish's mouth, and there will be a coin inside that fish's mouth. And you take it and you give it to the tax collectors to pay our debt to the Romans. Now, Jesus called that coin a piece of money, but it is, it, 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 it is the Greek word stator, which means a shekel less than a dollar in today's money. While traveling from Galilee and going down through Samaria towards the city of Jerusalem, Jesus met a certain man there. That man came to Jesus and in Luke 9, 57 said, Lord, I'll follow thee whithersoever thou goest. To this Jesus replied to this man in Luke 9, 58, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay His head. When our Lord was crucified, according to custom, the soldiers who crucified Him were to be given the belongings of the one that was being put to death. And in this case, the only thing the soldiers could claim from Jesus was the clothing that He had on His back. Financially, the Lord was not a rich man. Not by our standards, nor by their standards. But you know what? Wealth's not always measured in money. Or possessions. Or lands. Or gold. To me, the really wealthiest people are those who are contented with what they have. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6.6, he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. Philippians 4.11, we read this man of God writing, not that I speak in respect of want, for I learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Listen, contentment's wealth. Real wealth. Another word for contentment, according to the original meaning of the word, is self-satisfaction. Well, we looked at 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. You take godliness, which is holiness, and you combine it with contentment, self-satisfaction, and there you have great gain. The word gain there means acquisition. In other words, it's something that you have acquired. Paul writes, it's a great thing to acquire. Why is godliness and contentment a great thing to acquire? Well, because he gives the answer in 1 Timothy 6 7. He says, We brought nothing into this world, and certain we can carry nothing out. You ever hear the phrase, You can't take it with you? Paul says, You can't take it with you. And that's true. When we pass from this life, the only thing we're going to be able to take with us is our soul which has been housed within our body for the years that we walked upon this footstool of God. Our physical body stays. Our bank account stays. Our property, it stays. Jesus talked about this whenever He was in Judea. Luke chapter 12. A man came up to the Lord and, and this man and his brother were having differences. And, Je and this man asked Jesus, he says, Jesus, will you speak to my brother that he may divide our inheritance with me? Maybe this man's brother decided he was going to keep everything. So another, so he comes up to Jesus and he says, speak to him so that he will divide his inheritance from our father with me. Jesus spoke to the multitude with him and he said in Luke 12, 15, 
take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then Jesus speaks a parable to him. And here's the parable. Jesus says the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns, I'll tear them down, and I'll build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But unbeknownst to this rich man, his future looked pretty dim, didn't it? Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verses 20 and 21, God said unto him, this rich man who decided I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry, we've got all kinds of food. God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, the Apostle Paul had ended this idea of godliness and contentment being great gain in 1 Timothy 6.8 because there he wrote, having therefore food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And you know what? Isn't that really all we need? you got food to eat, you got clothes on your back, you got a place to stay, what more do you really need? You know, we all acquire things in our tenure here upon this earth. In fact, we usually end up with so much stuff that we don't have the place to put the stuff. Either that, or we end up having homes that look like these these homes we see on that TV show, Borders. <laughs> you ever seen any of that? There's a path that goes from the door to the door and you can't get off the path because there's, there's stuff. A lot of the things that we acquire over our lives we consider as treasures. Y'all got photographs you wouldn't part with, don't you? You might have antiques that belong to your mom or your dad or your grandparents or somebody you love that you wouldn't part with. You might have collections of salt and pepper shakers that you and your mate collected during your travels wherever you went here in this country. And you know there's nothing wrong with collecting things or keeping articles that have a sentimental value. And our, our Lord would not condemn us for wanting to hold on to ancient relics. But in the end, when our life is finally over with, when it's going to come to a close, and indeed it will come to a close, Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Whenever that day comes, what's going to happen to all those things we've acquired throughout our lives? Can't take them with us. Things we treasure, things that mean the most to us oftentimes are just temporal, temporary things. Well, after telling the parable of the rich fool, the man who's crops were so great that he said, I'm going to tear down the barns and build bigger barns, and then I'm going to say to my soul, soul, we've got all kinds of food. We're going to eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. After saying all of that, Jesus said in Luke 12, 31, but rather, he talks about what's really important here. He says, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, or as recorded in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. You know, God takes care of His own. He always has. He always will. 
The Old Testament minor prophet Malachi said, if you'll give to God, He'll pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. But many don't put God first because He's not the most important thing in their lives. The treasure they have accumulated is not spiritual. Rather, many today accumulate treasures that are physical, temporary. Then Jesus says in Luke 12, 34, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Anybody know what the Bible heart is? Yes, the Greek word cardia, and it actually means the mind. What you think about, what you plan on, that's what's really a treasure to you. That's what's really important to you. We think about the things that we treasure. You have things you treasure. I have things that I treasure. That pew right there contains things that I treasure. But I know the time's probably going to come and I'm going to have to leave that which I treasure. Can't take him with me when I die. Not at that time. And I wouldn't if I could. But realizing that fact, I also have a treasure that will go with me when I depart my life. The psalmist in the shepherd's psalm, Psalms 23 and verse 4, says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, to comfort His own, He said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. That word world there is the Greek word ion, which really means eternity. Jesus says, I'll be with you forever. I'm going to have to leave the ones I love here probably. But I'll never be departed from the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And that's a treasure that far outweighs any earthly, physical treasure. Talk about another treasure we have. I've got something at the house that I consider a treasure. It's a Bible. It's from the 1880s. My grandparents' family Bible. I guess it's a treasure to me because who, who it belonged to. But in reality, what is written within the pages of that book is what's the real treasure. How much of a treasure is the Word of God? Jesus told His apostles and His disciples in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach them what, Jesus? Well, Mark helps us out there, doesn't he? In Mark 16, 15, Mark says, Go into all the world and preach the, the Gospel to every creature. How precious is that Gospel? How much of a treasure is that Gospel? You know that's what saves? 1 Corinthians 15, 2. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians at Corinth, tells them that they are saved by the Gospel. The Gospel is that which has saved them. The Gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, consists of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. So it's the preaching of the Gospel. No, it's not just the preaching, is it? It's the obedience to the Gospel is that which saves. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says at the end of time, and Alvin, here's what you've been talking about this morning. At the end of time, the Lord and His mighty angels will be revealed from heaven. You remember? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the gospel's treasure. It is precious. 
It is precious because it saves. But it can only save those who will be obedient to it. You remember what the Gospel is? The Gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15. How in the world can we obey the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus? Very simply, we become dead to sin. We're buried in the waters of baptism with our Lord and we are resurrected to walk up out of that water a new creature. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Paul describes this glorious treasure of the Gospel. And he does it this way in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, we don't preach ourselves. And that's true. I've heard preachers who get into pulpit and they begin to brag about the things that they've done. Here's where I went. Here's what I did. Here's what I accomplished. That's not our purpose. We do not preach ourselves, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. But he says what we preach is Christ Jesus the Lord. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What does Paul call the Gospel there? He says that's a real treasure. Why is it a treasure? Because it saves. How does it save? It saves those who will be obedient to it. How can they be obedient to it? By dying to sin, being buried in the water of baptism, and rising up out of that water a new creature, a new person. One who has been added to the family of God because of their obedience. What do you treasure? Do you treasure physical things? hate to tell you this, but you're going to have to leave them someday. They'll stay here and you won't. How about treasuring the Gospel? It's able to save your soul. How about treasuring God the Father who sent His Son so that you can have forgiveness of your sins, salvation? How about treasuring Jesus who died on the cross in your stead and promises, Lo, I'll be with you always, even till the end of the world. Treasure things that really are valuable. Today, if you're here and not a Christian, treasure your soul. Jesus thought it so important that He was willing to give His life for it and suffer the cross so that you could have the salvation of your soul. Treasure the Word of God which teaches us what to do to be saved. Treasure God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit which guided men in the writing of that precious Word. The invitation is yours. If you're not a Christian, make this the day that you're baptized for the forgiveness of sins. If you're here and you're an erring child of God in any way, or you just re request the prayers of the church, won't you come while we stand and sing?